There is a story that has been told over the years that goes a little something like this. <clears throat> there were three young men that attended a Sunday service at a local congregation. The preacher just happened to be presenting a passionate and powerful lesson on the subject of hell. After worship concluded, the preacher approached the three young men and asked them some spiritual questions, hoping that they would consider the current condition of their souls. The boys didn't want to hear any of it, and as they kind of blew the preacher off, one of the boys asked the preacher sarcastically, Just how far is it to hell anyways, preacher? The boys hopped in their sports car, peeled out of the parking lot, throwing gravel as they flew off, and the preacher stood there considering the questions that one of the boy had asked. But what about that question? Seems pretty odd to ask, but I think it shows a lack of understanding concerning hell. Unfortunately, I don't think that we always comprehend the serious nature of hell. Maybe we do comprehend it. But it is always good to be reminded that hell indeed is real and that we must always be on guard so that we do not let our guard down and end up eternally separated from God. With this lesson, we want to seek to answer that question that young man asked, just how far is it to hell anyways? And we want to answer that question by looking at it from three ways. First of all, we want to talk about hell isn't far enough away. And then we want to look at the idea that hell just may be too close. And then we want you to consider how close hell is to you? How close are you to going to hell? Be sure to download the note card you'll find in the video description, a link to the note card, and follow along with the lesson. Fill it in. It'll be a record for you of what you have learned in this lesson from the Bible and I'll, by all means, get your Bible. Go get your Bible. How many of you have a Bible? I always ask that question. I always like to see the Bible. So get your Bible. Follow along. And if you like this sermon, ring the bell. Also, uh, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Ring the bell to get a notification of when new content is added. If you want to follow us on social media, links to our social media account are in the video description. So now, let's jump into the sermon. There is a story that has been told over the years that goes a little something like this. There were three young men that attended a Sunday service at a local church. The preacher just happened to be presenting a very passionate and powerful lesson on the subject of hell. After the worship concluded, the preacher approached the young men and asked them some questions and conversing with them about some things of spiritual nature consider to, and asking them to consider the condition of their souls. The boys didn't want to really hear any of it, and as they blew off the preacher, one of the boys asked the preacher sarcastically, "'Just how far is it to hell anyways, preacher?' Then the boys hopped in their sports car, peeled out of the parking lot, throwing gravel everywhere. The preacher stood there and considered the question that one of the boys had asked. Well, what about that question, though? Seems pretty odd to ask, but I think it shows a lack of understanding concerning hell. Unfortunately, I don't think that we always comprehend the serious nature of hell. Maybe we do comprehend it, but it is always good to be reminded that hell indeed is real and that we must always be on guard so that we do not let our guard down and end up eternally separated from God. So in this lesson, let's seek to answer the question of just how far it is to hell anyways. 
First of all, I want to suggest to you that it isn't far enough away. When we realize that it is real, Jesus taught as if hell indeed was a real place. Listen to what he said in Mark chapter 9 and verse 43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where the worm there does not die and the fire is not quenched. His story of the rich man and Lazarus gives us a foretaste of what eternal hell will be like. Turn in your Bible to Luke 16 and drop down to verse 23, if you will. In verse 23, being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix so that those who want to pass from here uh, to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them. Thus say also, come to this place of torment. If Hades is real, then we must recognize hell as being real as well. If we believe God, and the Bible, then we must believe that hell is a real place because of the way it is spoken of in the Bible. Hell is described as a real place reserved for the wicked. Matthew 25 and verse 46, notice, he said, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That's what he tells us there in that passage of scripture. Not only is it real, but the, its torment and punishment is real. As we saw in Matthew 25, verse 46, they'll go away into everlasting punishment. Hell is described in very vivid and terrifying terms. First of all, we just see it described in Matthew 13, verse 42, as a furnace of fire, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. And then we see it's described as a lake of fire, Revelation 20, 10. The devil who deceived them was uh, cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beasts and false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse 14, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Again, described in chapter 21 in verse 8, as a lake of fire, it says, the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, watch this, which is the second death. Again, it is described as eternal fire. Jude verse 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering, watch this, the vengeance of eternal fire. Then this fire is said to be unquenchable 
In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12, his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor, gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable, notice that, fire. In Luke chapter 3, verse 17, the same parallel in, in Luke's gospel his winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor, gather the wheat into his barns, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Described there is weeping and gnashing of teeth is described. The vivid terms all throughout Matthew and Luke chapter 13, we see that description. And then we see it described as a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, verse 41. Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you curse, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Some teach that the punishment of hell will only last for a period of time, and then the soul will be completely destroyed. This is known as annihilationism, and a soul will go out of existence at different times depending on the severity of the sins committed is what they say with this. This concept is foreign to the Word of God because it teaches that hell will last forever and be eternal. We see another aspect of hell, and that is it's eternal. Matthew 25 and verse 46, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Hell will last as long as heaven. Heaven, as we saw in our last lesson, is eternal, and here hell is eternal as well. The Greek word for eternal, anois, anos, used over 50 times throughout the Bible and is translated in different places as everlasting and eternal. A wide variety, but there is nothing that gives the impression that they will receive different levels of punishment. Nowhere in the scripture. Does the severity of sin matter to God and incur different kinds of punishment? And then another thing we understand about hell. Hell, although it's far, is too close. Back to the story of those three men, young men we started with that visited that congregation. The preacher continued to talk to other people that night. And just a little while later, a policeman pulled into the parking lot and he asked if anyone had seen a sports car that would have passed by the church just a little bit earlier. And the preacher told the policeman the car had left from the building and the officer informed them that the car had crashed just down the road. They crashed their car into a tree and they had all been killed in the crash. For those boys, hell seemed to be just two and a half miles down the road. It was closer to them that day than they realized. The Bible is full of individuals who were so very close to hell because of their actions. Some thankfully had the time to repent of their sins, but others unfortunately died in their sins. We start out thinking about Adam and Eve, how close they were as the closest fruit on the tree that was forbidden for them to eat. They were told that they could eat of all trees in the garden, but of the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge, good and evil, they weren't to eat of it, for in the day they ate of it, they would die. Of course, we understand, we read in Genesis 3, the story of how that Eve was tempted. She saw that the tree was, was a delight to the eyes, and, it, and she coveted it to make one wise, saw that it was good for food, and she ate it 
and gave it to her husband, Adam. He ate, and from that time on, sin was introduced to the world. Although we don't inherit the sin of Adam, the introduction of sin is there. And so Adam and Eve were as close as the lowest fruit on that tree. Then Nadab and Abihu were as close as the altar in front of them. Remember, God told them where to get the fire to put on the altar. Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire, that is, fire God had not authorized. And we see in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, that they were killed with fire from heaven because of doing what God had told them not to do. Hell was as close as the altar in front of them. Then Uzzah was as close as one touch of the ark of God. God had told them not to touch that ark, told them how to carry that ark, and they were carrying that ark on an ox cart, which God had not given authority for the ark to be carried that way. And the ark started to stumble. Uzzah put his hand out and went to stay the ark. And when he did, he was killed. And then David was as close as the nearest bed of adultery. We see the story of David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And how that he lusted after Bathsheba when he saw her bathing from his rooftop. And his desire then became for her, and he had her husband Uriah killed in the battle. And of course we know that Nathan told him the story of the man with the little ewe lamb and told David, you are the man. But that sin cost the life of his son that was born. And then Judas was as close to hell as the in noose on his rope. How he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, then went out and hung himself. Ananias and Sapphira were as close as their lie to the apostles and God that they had not kept back part of the prophets. And we know that Ananias was killed, dropped dead in front of the men, and then Sapphira, when she came in, the men carried her body out as well. Then Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8 and verse 15 was as close as his wallet and his greed, the man who wanted to buy the power of laying on of hands. And Peter told him that to pray that the thought and intent of his heart may be forgiven him. And he did and was forgiven. And then the apostle Peter was as close as the nearest Gentile Christian. Remember when the Gentiles came, when the apostles came, he would not eat with the Gentiles, but other times would, being a hypocrite in that regard. Put Peter as close as the nearest Gentile Christian. Paul withstood him to the face on account of that because Paul said he was guilty. Felix and Agrippa were as close as their decision would have been to obey the gospel. Felix trembled. Agrippa said, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. We don't know. History doesn't tell us whether either one of those men ever obeyed the gospel. But this we know. They were as close as the decision to obey the gospel from hell. Because if they didn't obey the gospel, they will spend eternity in hell. Hell is too close to every single one of us. One decision to sin against God lands us on the fast track to eternal destruction and punishment. And so the question becomes, how close is hell to you? Hell is as close as any sin you might commit. 
Maybe it's that moment where you lack self-control and give in to your temptation. Maybe it's that moment when you think God will be okay with your sin. It might be that time where you sin because you don't care anymore. And at that moment, you are as close to hell as you could ever be. Hell then is as close as the Lord's return. We don't know when Jesus will return. Matthew 24 and verse 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. I heard the story one time of the new preacher that moved in out into the country rural congregation, and he went out visiting one of his members one time, and the member was outstanding in his field. Not that he was outstanding in his field, but he was outstanding in his field. And the preacher asked him, he says, are you ready for the judgment? And the farmer says, well, I don't know. When will it be? The preacher said, well, it may be today and it may be tomorrow. The farmer said, don't tell my wife. She'll want to go both days. Sometimes that's kind of the way we think of hell. Don't want to go today. Don't want to go tomorrow. You know, I, I, need, to put, I need to put that off. But hell brethren, may be as close as the Lord return. It will come when we least expect it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. That's the way it will come. And finally, with this thought, hell is as close as your death. Hell could be one heartbeat away. Hell could be one stroke away. Hell could be one trip down the road away. Hell could be only one flight away. Much like the Lord's return, we have no clue when our time will be up. And if we're not right with God, then hell is going to be our eternal destination. And so it should be very clear that we need to consider this subject of hell very, very carefully. You want to avoid hell at all costs. And you start, if you haven't, by obeying the gospel. The Bible tells us faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We know that he who comes to God must believe that he is. He's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In John chapter 8 and verse 21, Jesus said to them, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sins. Where I'm going, you cannot go. And then verse 24, he said, I told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. He commands all men everywhere to repent. Luke 13, 3, I tell you, no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Paul tells us in Acts 17, 30, the time of this ignorance God overlooked now commands all men everywhere to repent. And then with the com mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. And then you must be baptized for the remission of your sins. I don't care what you've heard about baptism the Bible definitely teaches baptism is for the remission of sins. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, we learn that baptism is a burial. He said, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ we're baptized in his death. We were buried. Doesn't say we were sprinkled. Doesn't say we were, that water was poured over top of us. It says we were buried, therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And then we must remain faithful unto death. Revelation 2.10 
And in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Bob's your uncle. Cheerio. Now, thank you for watching this on YouTube. We invite you to the services of the Spring Hill Church of Christ, meeting at 405 Butler Street, Spring Hill, Louisiana. Our service time is 9.45 a.m. Sunday morning for Bible study, 10.35 for our morning worship assembly service, and then in the afternoon at 4 p.m. we have our pre-evening service. Wednesday evening, we meet for Bible study at 6.30 p.m., classes for all ages. Remember to download the note card that you can get with this lesson. Tell others about this channel, and be sure to subscribe and like this channel, and click the icon to be able to get updates of when we add new sermons to this site.